to do a recording to theirs for backup. Okay. Yeah, I can do it from mine. Um, awesome. Um, here. I mean, it says, okay, so this is already recording, but I'll start one. Thing. Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> but yeah. Um, and then Fiona, um, typically at the beginning of each session, we want to start with a check-in um, and allow folks to share like their names and pronouns out loud. And then if it's a large group, we'll usually ask them to do a longer check-in in the chat. Um, but if it's a smaller group, then we could like ask folks a question and they could share it verbally when they check in. But if you have any like specific question that you want to ask for the check-in, um, you totally can. Mm -hmm. um. Also, like, how how do I screen share on here? I probably want um, to. So I've made you co-host, and then at the bottom of the screen, there's like a green button that says share. Oh, share screen, right? Option to share screen. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, I want it off. Okay. Yeah, and it's just um one hour, right? Um, yeah, it's one hour, but if you if you need to go a little longer, that's totally fine because we don't have any sessions after this. Okay, cool. Usually people <sighs> How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. Um, I had a crazy day because half my company got laid off this morning. Oh <laughs> I my didn't god! Get laid off, but um, it was kind of just yeah, it was really crazy. Um, uh, kind of happened out of nowhere. Um. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a lot of like mixed feelings, obviously, because you know I was like spared the spared the guillotine or something, but um, definitely just like a really kind of a strange energy to like carry in. Yeah, it's a really intense time right now. Yeah, and it sounds like more and more folks are like facing that reality as well. So. Yeah, hopefully the astrology will <laughs> provide some solace. It doesn't, but <laughs> knowing about it might. <laughs> At least like awareness. Awareness, exactly. Um, how about you? How were your days? Mm, I mean, um, I'll say for me, I feel like it started off really sweet. Um, me, me, Sonia, and Sige filled in for like our morning movement meditation class this morning. Mm -hmm. That was really nice. Lee was there. Oh, it was so beautiful. So, also, so Lee, beautiful. I did not get to say earlier your outfit is beautiful. My outfit this morning. Yeah. Well, no, right now. Like I saw it in like the four p.m. workshop. I was like. That's a good outfit, but it's inappropriate um, for me to just unmute myself and say that right now. I'm trying to be like cozy in the house, but also like serve a look, you, you know? Like, <laughs> feel better about my life. Totally. <laughs> Thank you. Totally. Um, but yeah, I feel like my day started off sweet and then got a little busy. Just like my, my days have been really like call after call after call after call every day. Um, so I've been trying to like figure out how to pace things um, so I can like give my nervous system a bit of a break. Yeah. Um, but I feel like we're starting to get the swing of things. So, um, good. And I've been drinking tea. How's everybody else doing? I just came off the citywide mutual aid call. Oh yeah, I heard about that. Mm, how was it? More thorough updates later. It was really beautiful and also really overwhelming. There's just a lot happening in the city. And it's really, yeah, it's really inspiring to see how people are working on many different fronts and also overwhelming at how much, yeah, how much work there is to do and need. And so, they have some asks of us, um, so we can talk about that later. Awesome. But yeah, zooming all day. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Make my heart go boom, boom, boom. Supernova girl. 
Oh my God, we should play that song. <laughs> Y'all wanna listen to that song? I love you, Sagi. <laughs> that song? Y'all know that song? Yes. What's Not it from? Y'all like by heart, but I know of the song. Yes. What was it? Hmm. Proto. Oh, also, should I start letting people in to the room? Um. Oh, are there people already joining? Just a couple people. Just a couple people. Liberty, Liberty, Liberty. 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 Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think one of them might be the co-host this okay. evening. I'll let them in. Yeah. <laughs> oh, maybe not. That's all right. Speed of light, I'm so alive. Could you be my supernova girl? Interplanetary megastella hydrostatic. There's no gravity between us. Our love is automatic. Okay, I gotta get going because I gotta get ready for work. But it was nice talking to you all. Love you, Sonia. Hope you guys have a good workshop. Love you. Bye. You ready? Hello. Um, this is my co host, Martin. Oh my god, we're listening to Xenon. <laughs> Is that your music? <laughs> oh, also, did I make uh, did I make you a couple of Without question, up for every adventure she ever proposes, everything a BF should be. Nebula. ready for all the like zoom remixes of various songs with zoom in it oh, yeah. christina she just be coming out <laughs> oh 
Um, so for folks just joining, we'll probably get started around like 8.05, so just hang tight. Play more. Maybe to I'm gonna say if you wanna play another song then at the end of that song then we can get started. Any requests? Because I can't be held responsible for my actions. Oh, um the Space Jam theme song? Got you. Yeah. Yes, cat, yes. Everybody get up, it's time to slam now. We got a real jam going down. Welcome to the Space Jam. Space jam. Here's your chance, do your dance at the Space Jam. All right. All right. All right.
Everybody get up, it's time to slam now. We got a real jam going down. Welcome to Truly a space jam. It's a long song. <laughs> but it felt, you know, on the theme of astrology. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think it's probably time to get started. Um, I'm Fiona. I'm going to be the host of this fun discussion um, on the astrology of COVID-19 this evening. Um, so I'm joined by uh, my co-host this evening, um, Torrance, um, and I'll let him introduce himself. Hey, everybody. How are you? Hey. Awesome. Um, all right. So um, I think that we can start with just doing like a little check-in. Um, your names, your pronouns, because um, this is an astrology chat, your sun, moon, rising, um, if you feel comfortable sharing, and just a little bit about how your day is going. Um, and if you're feeling shy today, then, you know, feel free to just drop it in the chat box as well. So, um, we can do like a little tag team if people want to do that or like people can just like jump in. Um, but I can, I can stop. So Fiona, my pronouns are she and they. Um, I'm a Capricorn Sun, Libra Moon, Aquarius Rising. Um, and my day has been pretty damn weird because um, half my company just got laid off. Um, I was not one of them, but uh, it's, you know, very, very sort of like intense, um, intense transformations, intense shifts happening right now. So I'm kind of just sitting with that. Well, um, my name is Torrance. Um, my pronouns are he, him, and um, I'm an Aquarius sun, Virgo moon, and Pisces rising. And I had a really nice day, too. It's pretty chill. Just clean my room. I'm not muted. Okay, I guess I'll go. <laughs> this whole time, you guys can hear us eating. This is horrifying. <laughs> we are eating so loud. Okay. Um, shit. Well, that's how we're doing. We're eating really She's outside the window. To <laughs> Jasmine, uh, she, her pronouns. I'm a Gemini sun, Taurus moon, Pisces rising. Uh, I'm Yule. Uh, I'm a Libra sun, uh, Libra moon, and Aquarius. <laughs> Um, I'm Arthi, she, her, and I'm Capricorn, Sun, Capricorn, Rising, I think, and the Pisces, Moon. Um, I'm going to cook while tuning in, so I might turn my video off, <laughs> but nice to see everybody. Do we have to introduce ourselves? What? Um, since we're getting a little more crowded, um, if folks want to just drop their intros. Is there audio on? Yeah, can you hear me? Cool. Um, since we're getting a little more crowded now, um, if folks just want to drop their intros in the chat box, um, and while we're doing that as well, um, I would love to also invite everyone to just acknowledge the traditional stewards of the land that they're on, wherever you are, um, and also just take a second to acknowledge wherever else um, you feel um, is keeping you grounded right now. Um, so let's just all take a brief moment to do that while everyone um, is making their introductions in the chat box.
All right, well, let's keep the intros going, but I think, um, you know, let's get into what we're here to talk about today. Um, so I think that, um, you know, I'll just start by saying like the reason that I wanted to um, talk about the astrology at this time is because, um, and I and probably many of you have like perceived there to be like an airy accuracy <laughs> to the astrology um, in this time. And it's been like a really humbling experience for me to um, to really like stand in awe of this practice um, as we all sort of like move along with like the unfolding story of the cosmos and see it kind of like very much mirrored um, in the events that are unfolding. Um, so just to like set some like expectations and intentions, um, my, so my relationship with astrology is very much informed by traditional astrology um, as well as archetypal psychology and cosmology. Um, and so Terence and I are sort of like, you know, we're, we're both like quite like scholarly and nerdy about astrology. So, you know, that's going to be kind of like our approach to this topic today. Um, and like we definitely we will be taking mostly from like the Western tradition um, and also from Greek mythology. Um, so I'm just, I just really encourage you to use your discernment um, and take from it what you will. Like maybe not everything is going to be resonant, but that's, that's totally fine as well. Um, but just sort of um, a disclaimer on um, what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and so just to start with, um, you know, like you might be wondering like why, you know, I am sort of choosing to talk about both um, astrology and archetypes um, in relation to um, what's happening at this time. Um, and the reason for that is um, I personally see astrology um, as embodying elemental energies that play out on multiple levels, on personal, interpersonal, societal, and planetary levels. Um, and the method by which astrology activates um, these elemental energies is through the archetypes. Um, and the archetypes is something that psychologist Carl Jung um, described as being what shapes the human psyche. Uh, these fundamental themes and stories, uh, which are often unconscious but universal, like part of the uh, collective unconscious. Um, and these archetypes tend to map pretty well to astrological traits, themes, and patterns. So if we describe Saturn as being controlled and cold and limiting, it's because Saturn, the mythic archetype, was a cold controlled patriarch. And most of the myth that uh, undergirds modern astrology um, comes, you know, as we know from Greek ancient Greece, um, and that was also informed uh, primarily by ancient Egyptian and Babylonian astrology as well. Um, so the passage here from, um, from a brilliant archetypal psychologist um, named James Hillman, uh, which I think really encapsulates this notion. Um, and he says, uh, to the ancient Greek philosophers, Archai are the basic elements out of which experience is made. Archetypal psychology uses the penetrating vision of imagination to perceive those archai, those fundamental fantasies that animate all of life. Archetypal means fundamentally imaginal. So the message here is that um, those of us who practice astrology and archetypal psychology are really making the choice to experience life, thoughts, dreams, fantasies as all being part of the same fabric that is essentially poetic and imaginal um, and imbued with sacred meaning. Um, so now that we've set the stage, um, this workshop is kind of going to be broken up into two parts. Um, in the first part, Torrance and I are just going to talk about uh, the astrology of the current year, um, where it's been and where it's going. Um, and after that, we're going to open up to a brief Q&A session. Um, 
and hopefully we'll get to wrap up around uh, 9 p.m. tonight. Um, so for the first part, which is a talk, um, I wanted to do something a little different. Um, so what I want to do is just like invite you to get into like a comfortable state, whatever that means for you. It could be lying down, it could be closing your eyes, um, you know, whatever um, state that you want to be in to be more receptive, um, to be more active in your sort of subconscious and unconscious states. Um, I, I do still want you to listen actively and, you know, ask questions if something's unclear. Um, but I think that, you know, Torrance and I are going to be sort of like predominantly talking for the first part of the session. Um, so I just want everyone to be comfortable and prepared for that. Um, so let me just give everyone a second to get into a comfortable position. Like, you know, feel free to turn off your video, um, you know, whatever state you need to be in to just be in a comfortable, engaged, receptive um, state of being. All right, so let's begin. Um, so the transit that set the stage of the unfolding events of 2020 was the Saturn-Pluto conjunction in Capricorn on January 12th, uh, as I'm sure many of you have heard of. So we had uh, Saturn, the planet representing order, government structure, meeting Pluto, the planet of death, intensity, and transformation. There were many predictions at this conjunction um, where conjunction is where planets cross paths from the Earth's perspective of the sky uh, was going to bring particularly seismic shifts in our collective systems, particularly for government. This is a rare alignment that happens only every 34 years because Saturn and Pluto are both very slow moving bodies. And the last time that Saturn and Pluto conjoined in Capricorn uh, was during the Protestant Reformation in 1518. Um, and this was also the beginning of the African slave trade. So already from history, we're learning that um, Saturn-Pluto conjunctions are associated with the seeds of upheaval and transformation of ideology in the world order. So back to when all of this happened um, in January, along with Saturn and Capricorn, the Sun, Mercury, the South Node, and Jupiter were all in the sign of Capricorn. And so this was right when the coronavirus was really beginning to take hold in China, which is a country that really uh, embodies a lot of Capricornian qualities, hierarchy, control, efficiency, um, and there were also, at the time, the wildfires in Australia and the volcanic eruption in the Philippines, um, which were the first signs of sort of the destructive energies um, that were really being activated. So these very happenings, um, I feel like also foreshadowed the influence of Mars, uh, the planet of fire, initiative, aggression, entering Capricorn on February 16th, which is when the situation uh, really starts heating up in the West, uh, in Europe in particular. So as Saturn slowly separated, moved away from Pluto, um, both Jupiter and Mars were rapidly approaching Pluto in Capricorn. So around the middle of March, um, we had this incredible alliance of malefics um, the malefic planets are traditionally Saturn and Mars, um, and to a lesser extent, uh, Pluto as well. Um, all, they were all basically sitting on top of each other in the skies, like right as the situation starts to get 
really serious here in the States, um, which is around sort of like March 20th, um, that time period. And we had Jupiter, which is usually a benefic planet, in a very debilitated um, being both in the sign of its fall, Capricorn, and being enveloped by the malefic planets Mars and Saturn. So with Jupiter in a significantly weakened condition, Jupiter ends up being co-opted by Mars, Saturn, and Pluto. So here we have Jupiter being the fuel for growth and expansion, with Mars as the match that lights the fire, uh, Pluto as the force of destruction, and Saturn being the force of containment and isolation. It's the perfect storm that really propels Saturn, Pluto, and Capricorn themes to envelop the entire planet. Uh, the final dispositor, or sort of the lord of all of these planets in Capricorn is Saturn, uh, which is in its home sign. And as Saturn enters its zenith in the last degrees of Capricorn before entering Aquarius, the entire world goes into restriction, isolation, lockdown, hermitude, right? Very quintessential Saturn Capricorn themes. And, you know, as someone who's just coming out of their first Saturn return in Capricorn, um, I, I really watch all of this take place with um, a heavy dose of irony. Um, and things, you know, are, are not cooling down as of yet. Um, in early April, we had the Mars conjunction with Saturn on April 1st. Um, and Jupiter actually just conjoined exactly with Pluto this past Saturday. Um, and tomorrow we're going to have a Mars Uranus square, um, which might also, you know, add some shock and awe to the situation. So we're still very much in the immediate aftermath of these heavy transits. So in terms of how long things will last, um, it's a little unclear, but definitely not very soon in the near future. Um, if we take the lump of planets in Capricorn around the middle of March as sort of like the signature of the virus, um, we're actually still going to see this close alignment of Jupiter, Saturn, and Pluto in Capricorn throughout the rest of the year. Um, and that's because both Jupiter and Saturn are going to turn retrograde around the middle of May, meaning they're actually going to move backwards in motion and backwards in motion through Capricorn. Um, so Jupiter is going to retrograde back into conjunction with Pluto on June 30th, um, and Saturn is going to retrograde back into Capricorn on July 1st and remain there actually until December 17th. Um, and we're actually also going to have one last Jupiter-Pluto conjunction on November 12th, uh, right after the U.S. elections. Um, so the finale of all of these intense transits will likely be the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, um, also which is no, what is known as a great conjunction, um, in zero degrees Aquarius on December 21st of this year. Um, the great conjunction is an alignment which happens every 20 years or so. Um, and it's, it's a time for a changing of the God dynamic. Um, it's associated with the rise and fall of ruling authorities um, because it recalls the clash of Zeus or Jupiter uh, with his father, Cronus or Saturn, which resulted in the Olympian gods overthrowing the Titan gods for supremacy in the heavenly realm. Um, so in a sense, like all the events that are happening this year are sort of building up to this Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, which is going to happen in December. Um, so I want to move on now to just exploring um, the archetypes of the Saturn-Pluto conjunction. Uh, which I think really holds the central themes of what's unfolding right now. Um, 
So both Saturn and Pluto have this deep association with the Earth. Um, Kronos, the ancient Greek Saturn, was also the god of harvest. Um, and Pluto, for the ancient Greek Hades, is also god of the underworld. Right? The underworld is a place that is literally buried underneath the Earth. So Saturn Pluto is really uncovering, unearthing what is the foundation of this world. Beyond just seeing what's on the surface, Saturn Pluto really digs deep in a way that's relentless about revealing what's usually hidden. I feel like that speaks so much to the moment where we're having this, you know, like the Blizzard of Oz moment and people on a societal level in the US are being shown what's really behind the curtain. In terms of the government, but also in terms of you know other human beings, the masks you know are all slipping, even as we're being told to put them on. It's almost like on some level the authorities are reacting to being truly clothed for what they really are, like Darth Vader and Star Wars, seeing all the scars, hideousness um, hidden beneath this cool, impenetrable exterior. Um, so Richard Thomas, um, an archetypal astrologer, says something very interesting about Pluto. He says, the nature of Pluto is to press towards greater intensity, to the extreme, to be compelling, deep, radical, as in Radix, root, grounded in the depths, drawing on the power of the underworld, driving whatever it touches to an overwhelmed potency that has a compulsive, destructive, even self-destructive potential. So in some sense, Pluto is overwhelming Saturn right now. And not just Saturn in terms of governmental control, but also Saturn in terms of our own sense of control and order over the world that we inhabit. Uh, Pluto is also the planet of greed. Um, it's the reward of plutocracy, for example, uh, because in ancient Greece, wealth in the agricultural sense was thought to, to spring from under the earth. So we also have this dimension of intensifying fear and greed that's coming into tension with societal order through sheer intensity. Pluto is overwhelming the status quo of Saturn. And when we see an exacerbation of greed and hoarding, we're also coming into direct confrontation with the collective shadow of Capricorn. And this actually comes from a severance from uh, the themes of Cancer. Because um, Cancer is a sign that's opposite to Capricorn. And cancer also represents, you know, the themes of care, nurturance, um, and mutual protection. So without a connection to cancer, the shadow aspects of Capricorn run amok. So the shadow is formed when there is an extreme imbalance between two poles, in this case, cancer and Capricorn, which is to say that when a fragmentation arises between two things, that are really one, we have uh, an emergence of both an ego and the shadow aspect. In normal, in normal circumstances, um, it can be difficult for us to recognize the connections between these seemingly separate impulses because all the mechanisms by which ego consciousness and shadow are kept apart are well-functioning. On a societal level, we see it manifest when the privileged are kept away from the marginalized, the imprisoned away from the free, the sick away from the healthy. But because of the pressure cooker of Pluto, these boundaries are starting to feel porous. A healthy person may become a sick person. A privileged person may lose their jobs and become impoverished. It's getting to the point where, you know, certain protected statuses are retrenching and, and slowly showing themselves to be unstable and insecure. 
Um, and I'm sure a lot of these themes are playing out in our collective fears right now. Um, and to that, I would say like the quest of the shadow is to become integrated. In order for the shadow to become integrated, uh, it's important to acknowledge those fears, um, to meet them as energies to be worked with um, and not denied, repressed, or on the opposite end, sort of completely overpowered by. An act of meeting the shadow um, in this circumstance could be trying to identify with the possibility of losing a protected status, like acknowledging that I could become sick or lose my job. It's hard to face those fears, but with so much of what's stable and secure is slipping, um, we've sort of entered the zone of instability that requires a greater degree of preparation. Uh, it's, it's a balancing act as well, because I'm sure there are plenty of folks out there who are overwhelmed with anxiety and constantly thinking about those fears. But it's really a time um, for us to find grounding, find roots while we face those fears. And one place where we could potentially find this grounding, this rooting, is in the sign of cancer where the north node of the moon currently is um, representing the north node of the moon representing the comic fate of the collective so the cancerian themes of mutual care trust and support applies to other humans but also to the supporting energies of the cosmos as well cancer reminds us that um, there is an overflowing of abundance when we find grounding in generative, life-giving energy. Um, and once we're rooted in that place, we can then begin to shed the structures of the Capricornian shadow, which will not be easy, but I think we might um, get a lot of help with this from the great conjunction, conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn in Aquarius, um, which is happening in December. So now I'm going to um, pass this on to Torrance um, to speak a little more. Oh, you're muted, Torrance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so the Jupiter Saturn conjunction is going to take place, um, I believe, on December 20 first of this year um let me just make sure i'm correct yes so december 21st of 2020 um jupiter and saturn will be meeting in the sky in the sky in the sky in the sign of aquarius um so basically over the past 200 years jupiter and saturn the great conjunction has been occurring in earth signs and along with that um we can see the Industrial Revolution and um, the essentially the dominance of the Earth um, through the Anthropocene by human beings um, and our technologies. What the 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 thing about the Great Conjunction is that this happens in about two hundred years or so cycle. So the last time that um, Jupiter and Saturn actually met in an air sign was the first time in many, many centuries. And that was in 1981, um, which, you know, when we think about historically of that time, uh, we can think of, it's not the prettiest time, but we think of uh, the election of Ronald Reagan here in the United States, uh, Margaret Thatcher in the UK, um, essentially the beginning of the neoliberal capitalist order um, that came in along with this Jupiter-Saturn conjunction in 1981. Um, previous ones in the 20th century were uh, 1940, 41. So we're talking about like the, in the height, the really beginning of um, World War II. Also in 1961, which the really 
predominant uh, theme in the United States was the beginning of like the civil rights movement, the election of JFK, et cetera. Um, but what we have to look forward to with this is that we're now entering a new 200 year or so cycle of all air. And the difference between air and Earth in terms of these Jupiter Saturn conjunctions is, you know, Jupiter brings in um, a great sense of benevolence, of largesse. We're talking about the supposed Zeus, Jove, king of the gods, um, expansion, new opportunities, new age of Aquarius, yes. <laughs> you could also, we could argue this is the basically official beginning of the age of Aquarius, um, which is really cool. Uh, I'm an Aquarius son, so I'm excited about that. But um, yeah, like Jupiter is largesse, it's expansion, it's wealth. Aquarius is the air sign. Um, it's wealth, it is um, wisdom, intelligence. So like we're talking about the higher arts, um, you know, philosophy, um, academia, very Jupiterian. Anywhere where we're making a practice out of pursuing wisdom. But also Jupiter can be excess and jubilance and joy and like a big party as well. So nightlife could also be seen as a very Jupiterian place. Um, when we're talking about Saturn, you know, like Fiona touched on this themes of, you know, um, contraction, cold, um, like elementally, Saturn is seen as like a dry, cold energy, and Jupiter is a hot, wet energy. So we're bringing those two together. Hopefully what we're creating is some fertility, and that's what we tend to see historically, is we're seeing like entirely new innovations and movements. Um, they're both very esoteric and intellectual and philosophical planets. So the, the energies they bring tend to be like new ideological movements. So with that in mind, um, I think it's important to consider that in 1981, like, yes, like, neoliberal capitalism began really in full force as we know it today at that time. But also, um, the supposed, like, New Age movement began in turn as well. Like, around 77 to 81 to 3 is when you really see the, the, the beginning of people all over the world em embracing spirituality and kind of, and no offense if anyone practices Christianity and discovers it, you know, um, but a lot of people leaving Christianity as their primary form of spirituality to kind of like a more um, self-directed, intellectual spirituality, um, which I think is very much air in terms of um, its quality. It's, it's very air to want to make like an intellectual exploration of your spiritual views. Um, but hopefully with the end of this year, what we'll see is a new 200 year cycle beginning where we, um, you know, younger people, very Aquarian, um, Aquarians, the youth, um, will be able to establish some new political, sociological, ideological paradigms that won't carry uh, just merely in our own lifetimes, but will carry generations beyond us. And this is happening at zero degrees Aquarius. Aquarian themes are about technology, innovation. Um, when we think of Aquarius, we think of the myth of Ganymede. So Ganymede was a young mortal um, boy. I think he was Trojan. I'm not sure exactly where in Greece he was, but uh, Zeus had his eye on Ganymede. Um, it isn't necessarily the cleanest of myths, but um, Zeus essentially took Ganymede as his sex slave and brought him up to Mount Olympus um, and asked, basically didn't really ask him, he made him the cupbearer to the gods. Um, what that meant for Ganymede is Ganymede had to kind of give up his, his life as just a mere mortal and take on this new role. And by the way, he was a prince in his former life. So he had to take on this new role where he's now like a subservient member of the Olympian pantheon. Like he's kind of like a demigod. He's not a mortal. He's not a god. He's kind of in between. So one day um, Ganymede was kind of just like longingly like observing the earth 
um, and what was going on back in his own home. And he saw that his own people were suffering from really severe drought. And this was heartbreaking for him. Um, and in that time, in that moment, Ganymede struck out in this kind of vengeful fit of anger and sadness. And Zeus is like, what's going on? What's the problem? Um, and Ganymede petitioned to Zeus, like, you need to save them. This is, un it, it's really unfair for me to be here, like, in this space, you know, this is like the great opulence. We're thinking of the opulence of the gods on Mount Olympus. So Ganymede's up here basically serving the elites. He's been hand-selected, you know, Zeus's uh, eagle swoops down, brings him up to Mount Olympus, hand-selected to serve this elite group have no more connection with his like lowly origin as a mortal and to just like kind of give up any kind of human value. And he couldn't do that. It was heartbreaking for him. So Zeus was so touched by the fact that, that Ganymede was still attached to his, his humanity, which is an interesting notion. Um, Zeus was touched by that. So, what they like to do in Greek mythology is they like to make you a constellation if they're really impressed by you. So what Zeus ended up doing is making Ganymede into the constellation we now know as Aquarii, Aquarius, um, Ganymede. So that's just an interesting theme to think about because you're talking about someone who is um, a liminal character. Um, he's a demigod and he is in a position of extreme privilege in comparison to where he came from. And that's a very Aquarian theme. So we have this great opportunity, I personally believe, um, at the beginning of the Aquarian age to really bring the gods down to earth and speak truth to power to the elites in our, on our own planet in our own world, like in real life, like there are essentially gods of the society who live in opulence and grandeur and are entirely disconnected from our real lived realities. And I'm sure many people on this video right now can relate to having work cut and all kinds of bullshit like that. So um, the fact that we are suffering in this way and there is, there's kind of a deaf ear. It's up to us to kind of all be the Aquarian Ganymede and to cause a ruckus and to force those who have the power and the privilege in our society to wake up to the reality that we're all kind of living here on the ground. And this Jupiter-Saturn conjunction at the end of the year, I mean, we've already gotten to see how 2020 is rolled. Like, it, this has been quite a year, like it, it, it's unpredictable, but I, I can assure, I think, I can assure all of us, um, at least I feel this way myself, is that, I mean, I know I'm going to be speaking up, like I hope all of you will be, because we're going to have to collectivize, these are Aquarian themes, we need to collectivize, we need to recognize humanity as a, as a singular family, as a singular force um, of power and strength. And we need to take back the reins of our culture and society. And that's that. Like, um, that's what Aquarius is about. It's about being able to envision a future, but also to take practical action. This is a solid fixed sign. We're not immutable. We're not going to do anything necessarily unexpected. Um, but we will have like innovative ideas, probably ones we've already heard time and time again, things like UBI, for example, obviously, um, healthcare for all. Um, but there are very practical things that we can do to solve the myriad of crisis that we're facing as a collective. And that's what Aquarius is about, is like being able to look at the scenario, look at the situation, see it for what it is, a fixed sign, and to, make practical, pragmatic alterations to that. Um, 
I personally practice more of like a classical astrology, so I don't consider Uranus or any outer planet to be a ruler. Um, we can argue about that later. But like Saturn is the ruler of Aquarius and Saturn's the contemplative side, or excuse me, Aquarius reflects the contemplative side of Saturn, whereas Capricorn is more like the workaday Saturn. Uh, you know, like Saturn, it's about the material, the earthly. Saturn and Aquarius it gets to put the work down and to reflect. And we're entering a time that is very much star card, if any of you are familiar with the tarot. I mean, like we're, we're going through a tower moment and when the smoke clears and I feel like the Saturn Jupiter conjunction at the end of this year, the, the um, winter, winter time solstice will be like a big star like eye opener where we're able to see the myriad stars of possibility and future and potential for humanity and be able to really take in kind of like that healing water and reflective essence of these times that you know we're having this opportunity to sit in contemplation and really get to know like what our personal potentials are and what they are as a collective so that's super exciting um, I'm going to hand it back to Fiona, but thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so we have a few minutes um, for questions. Um, if you want to, you know, just ask one, whatever's on your mind, or if you're feeling shy, drop it in the chat box. Um, we can definitely take a few. Oh, so Pam has a question about tomorrow's um, conjun conjunction, if we can elaborate, um, mm -hmm. since it's her birthday. <laughs> Happy um, birthday. So I'm, yeah, I mean, Torrance, maybe you could correct me on this, but I think there is a Jupiter-Pluto conjunction on Saturday, and tomorrow is the Mars-Uranus square. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Um, hmm. Okay, so bright side, bright side view. Uranus has been in Taurus for about mm, a year-ish now. It had like a little retrograde moment. Um, Uranus will be in Taurus until like 20, 25, 26. So we're looking at like a solid half decade of unexpected uranium, unexpected out of the blue, striking innovative transformation in Tarian, in Tarian places, Tarian, uh, in the Tarian realm, I guess you could say. Like, so Tarian themes are banking, monetary systems, um, our materials that we gather from the earth, um, the earth herself, um, the, you know, all of our food systems that are, reliant on the earth um so you know clearly climate change clearly themes of um ecological um shifts that hopefully we can adapt to and hopefully stave off some of those um but I don't want to get too much into Uranus and Taurus, but like uh, Mars in Aquarius is, you know, you're bringing Mars's like active, aggressive, warrior-like energy into the fixed air Aquarius. So it, that, that energy in an air sign play out, plays out more in the mind. Um, so very active mental life, um, possibly very philosophical and intellectual type of energy. In square, that's a relationship that's kind of antagonistic. Um, it's a 90 degree angle, so there is kind of um, an un, I don't want to call it unhappy, but it's just the, the relationship is antagonistic. It's a little difficult between both the planets. So Uranus and Mars are both power packed. Uranus is like lightning, Mars is like fire. And bringing those together, an air and an earth sign, that's kind of a strange, it's kind of dampening. So I'm actually not too concerned about like something more crazy than what's already happening, happening. I think um, what we're going to see is um, hopefully some grounded 
fresh ideas like Mars and Aquarius bringing these fresh concepts and Uranus and Taurus being like an open like more of an openness within people for like new ideas um you know Taurus is a little more conservative so like Uranus and Taurus kind of opens up the field for like um some more innovation so I'm hoping like we have some more innovative ideas come about for how we can help people pay their fucking rent and like <laughs> be able to feed their families and you know hopefully on the medical side help you know help the people who are actually suffering and dying from this right now um but yeah i i we're we'll stay tuned for the week um i'm in a like very like non-predictive mode right now i don't know about you fiona because <laughs> the you know the world's pretty crazy yeah i don't want to say anything and get my ass kicked so. <laughs> I, yeah, I, mean, I, think, I think Mars square Uranus is really sort of just emphatically making the point of just like the unexpectedness of the moment right now. It's like yeah. really kind of just adding, sprinkling a little more like uncertainty, like potential, potentially shocking, you know, happenings into the air. Um, but, you know, it's it goes either way, right? Like we're not, we're not saying that this is going to be something bad, but you know, just something, just a little more like unexpectedness. Um, so Maya had a question um, about, um, is, this, is this the age of air signs, all three or specifically Aquarius? Specifically Aquarius. So that's based on the great procession um i don't know if we even have enough time but like where are we at like, we have like a minute. but um basically we're the processional shifts they they happen every about 2160 years so 2160 years or so it's arguable you can find like a thousand astrologers with different opinions on this um i am personally in the camp that these uh, Saturn-Jupiter conjunctions are a really excellent marker of each age. So um, Johann Kepler in the early 16th century actually theorized that the Saturn-Jupiter conjunction of 7 BC was what, what ancients saw when they saw the, the star of Bethlehem, the star of the nativity, that they saw like the star of Christ. Um, when Saturn and Jupiter, which are both visible to the naked eye, came together at that time, many astrologers believe that's what people actually were seeing. It wasn't uh, a star outside of our, our, our solar system. It was actually that great conjunction. So I'm personally following the camp that that was the marker at the beginning of the, the age of Pisces. And we are now seeing the new marker um, in 2020, in December, of the age of Aquarius beginning. So, yeah. Um, I think we have time for one more question. I mean, I, I guess, like, just wanting to add as well, like, how all of this, like, collective, like, Capricorn um, clusterfuck <laughs> is, like, playing out <laughs> on it. <laughs> On a personal level, um, I would advise you to just like see where Capricorn falls um, in your whole sign house system. Um, and if you have any questions about that, then, you know, we, I think, you know, if there is enough interest to sort of keep exploring this topic of astrology, um, archetypes and COVID, then like we're sort of happy to host um, further sessions about um and just sort of like to get it a little bit more personal have have it more like an open discussion about um about what's going on astrologically this year as well um so parisa says fifth house, <laughs> oh, fifth house yeah fun <laughs> <laughs> good i'm glad it doesn't feel fun <laughs> Do you enjoy it? <laughs> but yeah. yeah. Terrible relationship to work and productivity and being vulnerable is awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but structured fun. Lots of structured fun, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's why I cry every year on my birthday. <laughs> I'm dealing with it. I'm learning to deal with my Capricorn placements. Yeah. It's yeah. a lifelong thing. That's how Saturn works. Yeah. Really is. I think there were some questions earlier in the chat just around oh. the um, different folks that you had named earlier in the post. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, do, do y'all mind dropping uh, those in the chat too for folks? Sure. Thank you. Um, so there is a question about from Lee about Capricorn stellium, stellium mostly in the first house. It's killing me slowly. <laughs> well, um significations do you know the significations of the first house i'm gonna break it i know it's about self that's all i've read like it's very much about self 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 I yeah know. it's help <laughs> okay so it's interesting because western astrology takes kind of a less serious view of the first house um and the, you know, I kind of dip into Vedic a little bit. So with in Vedic astrology, first house is called Lag. It's the Lagna. Um, and it's the only house um, that truly in the chart represents you. So you could think of the first house. Like I love to think of it as like, if the, the, the chart itself is the ship of your soul, then the first house is kind of... Um, the, uh, not pilot, the captain's room, <laughs> you know, like it's the, the place where the captain and the co-pilot actually sit. The captain of your ship, of your chart, is the ruler of the first house. So Capricorn's ruler is Saturn, the Lord Saturn of first house Capricorn. Where is Saturn at in your chart? I'm, I'm exiting my Saturn return. Oh, yeah. Okay. So Saturn's been moving through your house of self. So self is appearance. It's the body. It's the way you carry yourself through the world. Um, you know, like very like literal to the, to yourself. Like that is the first house. Um, so it would likely be an event where the past couple years have been pretty intense um in terms of the your the way the world receives you like you've maybe had some growing pains the very saturnian um and some maturing through like navigating your relationships the, the opposite house of the first is the seventh with the seventh house is the house of other people so I imagine, you know, with Saturn having moved through your first house over the past couple of years, we had Pluto be in your first house since 2008, which by the way, everyone, was the great crash, the recession, 2008. <laughs> That's when Pluto went into Capricorn. So Pluto moving through the first house since 2008, you've had Saturn in there, you've had Jupiter in there for a few months now until the end of this year. Mars has been in there the past couple months. I imagine you've had a really intense fucking year. <laughs> Sorry, in the very least. Um, down, down. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, okay, and the, on the bright side of that, it's like, I imagine also you feel so much more comfortable in your own skin and so much more like ready to handle whatever comes for you and like keep in mind you're not gonna ever have to deal with pluto come 2024 in your first house ever again so that's like most people never experience that transit in their life pluto moves through a sign over the course of like a decade plus depending on the sign so you were blessed with a really intense transit that very few people get experience i imagine that over the next couple of years you have a lot of um leadership or just really important opportunities coming ahead that this these transits have really prepared you for so hopefully be on the lookout 
Um, so we have one last question from Arati. Um, do you know anything about Vedic astrology in regards to the age of Aquarius? Is there an equivalent? So Vedic astrology, some Vedic astrologers recognize the, the procession. Some don't really touch on that because it's not the, the, this kind of procession of equinox theme is really what it's really a Western astrology thing, to be honest. Um, and, you know, I, I'm a proud Western style astrologer for the most part, even though I do use Hellenistic and some Vedic technique. Um, but Vedic astrologers, you, you can find many who do explore like the procession of equinox. In fact, we're entering the age of Aquarius, but they tend to actually be Westerners who started practicing Vedic astrology. Whereas you might not find very many like traditional Vedic astrologers, and I shouldn't even, sorry. It's a misnomer to call it Vedic astrology. It's actually Jyotish. Um, so those who practice Jyotish, you will find very few traditionally who are going to acknowledge procession. Um, that being said, there are many things that, like beautiful things that exist in either tradition that don't exist in the other. Um, like for example, the nakshatra, lunar mansion system, which I don't need to get into all that. It's super fun. We can talk about that later. Um, but that's in Vedic astrology, that's in Jyotish. It's not really in Western astrology, but it's really fun. The, I think the processions are really fun. And it's a really cool theme to be able to contextualize like pretty epic transformations um, in our lives. And if it's useful when not use it. I find it deeply useful. So there's that. Yeah, well, I think um, this might have to be the end of our session today, but I just want to take a moment for us, you know, let's just like all collectively like acknowledge ourselves and each other and the cosmos and, you know, the astrology and just like give thanks to the stars for like being there with us. Um, if it's okay, sometimes we like to just unmute everyone so we can all just collectively yeah. like give y'all love and gratitude. So we're gonna do that now. Everyone just love up on Fiona. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, if you're interested in further sessions, um, there's like a registration link in the Cloud9 calendar. Um, so just fill that out and we will email everyone um, a copy of the, the, the audio recording and just let y'all know if we want to do this again sometime. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Oh. Oh. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you guys so much. Happy also, birthday, Pam. Yeah, happy birthday, Pam. Happy yes. early yes. birthday, Pam. Happy Thank birthday, you. Pam. I appreciate it. You are my it's your fucking birthday It's a fucking celebration Tonight we celebrate Seems like times Out of our control It's a celebration Oh ho it's your birthday, baby, it's your birthday, yeah. Who's gonna love you on your worst day? You told, so tough, I know You're soft like buttercups Reese's, Reese's, don't be ridiculous Just say your piece and peace up like Ibiza Cool your head top, you hotter than Anita Bacon, baby, tell me where I need to To be, to feel Feel that emptiness inside you Petty bullshit shouldn't excite you On your birthday It's your brrrr, It's your fucking birthday <laughs> Hey,
birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was lovely. We love you, Pam. Love you all. Yeah, please follow Corinth and Fiona and fill out the form. Thank you. I'm about to follow you right now, actually. Love, love, love. Amazing. Thank you for that. Yes. It was so our pleasure. Thank you so much. It was awesome. <laughs> Do it again. Do it again, <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Good night, y'all. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye.